Hi everybody and welcome to Love Fraud Live. Our brains and biology are hardwired to fall in love. Unfortunately, sociopaths take advantage of this basic fact in order to seduce us. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'm going to talk about love, sex, your brain, and sociopaths. This is a live streaming show, and I'll answer your questions at the end. So please send them to me as we go along tonight. You can also use our super chat function to ask your question and also make a donation to Love Fraud at the same time if you'd like to do that. So ever since the beginning of recorded history, humans have been trying to understand and explain the mysteries of love and sex. Over the past few decades, scientists started using specialized equipment to measure physical arousal by attaching devices to private parts. More recently, they've been observing the most important romantic organ in the human body, which is the brain. Dr. Andrea Spartles at the Imperial College of London pinpointed the areas of the brain that are activated by love using brain scanning technology. He used a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine called an fMRI, which is an MRI for the brain. It captures images of the brain activity in response to certain stimuli. So Bartles did a study of 17 people who were madly in love. He had the test subjects look at photos of platonic friends and also of their loved ones while he observed the activity in their brains. The resulting brain images clearly showed that certain sections of the brain are stimulated by love. The scientists then did another study to observe the brains of mothers looking at their infants. The images showed that exactly the same areas of the brain were stimulated by maternal love, except for an area in the hypothalamus, which is at the base of the brain, that seems to be linked to sexual arousal. The conclusion, then, is that specific areas of the brain light up and become activated at the prospect of love. Bartles also noticed something else. When the test subjects were feeling love, three regions of the brain generally associated with moral judgment go dim. In other words, when people are in love, certain areas of the brain shut down. Love also affects the chemistry of our brains. Dr. Helen Fisher, who is a professor at Rutgers University, had written that three networks in the brain are associated with love. And these are the lust network. This is the craving for sexual gratification, which is linked to testosterone in both men and women. Then there's the romantic attraction network. This is the elation and yearning of new love, which is linked to the natural stimulants of dopamine and neuroprofessorine and low activity in serotonin. And finally, the attachment network. This is the calm emotional union with a long-term partner, which is linked to oxytocin and vasopressin. Dr. Fisher also did a study using fMRI technology. She scanned the brains of 40 men and women who were wildly in love. When these people gazed at photos of their beloveds, the scans showed increased activity in the areas of the brain that produce dopamine. Now, dopamine is a neurochemical that is associated with feelings of excessive energy, elation, focused attention, and motivation to win rewards. Dopamine, by the way, is also the neurotransmitter that is associated with addiction. In fact, cocaine works by increasing the amount of dopamine in the brain, which creates feelings of euphoria. Finally, 
research has also proven what we've probably all experienced, that sexual arousal can make us throw caution to the winds. In yet another study using fMRI technology, Dr. Ken Maravilla of the University of Washington found out that sexual arousal dims down the parts of the brain that control inhibition and moral judgment. Additional researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon documented that being sexually turned on affects the judgment of college-aged men. Huh, well, that's a surprise. Specifically, the researchers found that sexual arousal seems to decrease the importance of other considerations, such as behaving ethically towards a partner or protecting yourself against unwanted pregnancy or disease. But the researchers also found that people seem to have only a limited insight into the impact of sexual arousal on their own judgment and behavior. In other words, most of us don't appreciate how strong the sex urges are and how they can make us do things that perhaps we shouldn't be doing. So let's look at all this information in the context of our relationships with sociopaths. Two of the main strategies that sociopaths use to snare us are love and sex. They emphatically proclaim their love and consciously seduce us into having sex. So what happens? Well, first, love causes specific areas of the brain to turn on. And at the same time, areas associated with morals and judgment go dim. Second, the areas of the brain that produce dopamine become active and dopamine is related to euphoria and addiction. Third, sexual arousal dims the parts of the brain responsible for inhibition and judgment that might prevent us from making bad choices. And fourth, we do not recognize the impact that sexual urges have on our judgment and behavior. Sociopaths convincingly proclaim their enduring love and their sexual desire for us. We don't know that they're lying, so we believe that they really love us. We have sex with them, and the sex is great. Many love fraud readers have been amazed at the sociopath's sexual appetites and their prowess. Therefore, sociopaths hijack our brain through our feelings of love and the bonds of sex. In their seductions, they turn the natural psychological and chemical functions of our brains against us. That's the presentation for tonight. And next I'll answer your questions. And as I mentioned earlier, we implemented Super Chat on this YouTube show, which offers you an opportunity to contribute towards love frauds uh, functions. And believe me, there's a lot of expenses associated with this. So I really appreciate all the donations that we've received so far, especially from William who donated tonight. So if you'd like to support us, all you have to do is click the dollar sign in the chat window and slide the button to the amount that you want. And also there's a link in the description below the video window where you can make a tax deductible contribution to Love Fraud's education programs if you'd like to do that. So let me take a look and oh, we got some chat going here. See what the, um, see if there's any questions. Okay, so Kitha Marita asks, do, psych do psychopaths produce oxytocin? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know about producing it, but I have seen some information which seems to indicate that psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists do not have oxy the, the right amount or functioning oxytocin receptors. Uh, the way this works is that 
um, the neurotransmitter, the, the chemical substance is produced and it goes into the, the body and the brain and the bloodstream and it latches on to specific receptors that are in the brain and also in other locations in the body. And there has been some discussion or speculation that psychopaths may not have functioning receptors for the oxytocin. In fact, um, there's a book called The Moral Molecule. And I'm drawing a blank on the author's name, but we have written about it on love fraud. And, and he's, th this book talks all about oxytocin and explains everything about it. And he made a comment that approximately 4% of people don't seem to have these oxytocin receptors. Well, coincidentally, 4% is about the same amount, the same figure for estimates of people who are, um, have antisocial personality disorder. So, um, I mean, they did mention the possibility with uh, that these disorders involve a lack of receptors, or that's one of the things that go on. There's, there's certainly more, but there, there could very well be a correlation between a lack of oxytocin receptors and um, sociopaths, psychopaths, narcissists. Okay. <laughs> Deborah says, I'm getting a dog. Dogs are great. Wonderful. Okay. So Angel Marie says, what are the most common reasons for sexual dif dysfunction in sociopaths? Are they different reasons for different ages? My ex is in his 20s and definitely has a form of this. Um, well, if by dysfunction you mean that um, <clears throat> the parts aren't working anymore, I would say that sociopaths can be subject to all the same health problems that anyone else can. I mean, just because they're sociopaths doesn't mean they don't get old and doesn't mean they don't um, lose their abilities or, or anything like that. So um, I could definitely say that age has a function in um, dysfunction, uh, but you're saying that your ex is in his 20s so, um, I would say that it's probably some typical health problem or maybe alcoholism or something like that. Because, you know, as, as William Shakespeare said, alcohol uh, increases desire and decreases uh, performance or something along those lines. I'm, I'm par paraphrasing. Um, so that could be it. I mean, just, just the typical things. I, I haven't heard of any specific dysfunction related to these personality disorders. Uh, not saying that it doesn't exist, but I haven't heard of that. So I, I would say that it's probably just a health issue, um, some run-of-the-mill run health issue that, that is causing that situation. Okay. Okay, so Kitha Morita says, why does it still hurt so much to know my sociopath is telling all the same lies to the new girlfriend and that he never felt this before, that he hasn't told anybody he loves them before? It still really hurts to think about. The issue is that you were deceived. Um, he was lying about his love. Um, sociopaths are incapable of feeling love. I mean, that, I mean, that's, that's the core of the disorder is that sociopaths do not have the ability to love. And I can explain that a little bit, um, which I've mentioned on a few other videos. So if you've heard this before, uh, my apologies, but essentially other researchers, besides the ones that I talked about tonight, have found that there are three components to romantic love. 
and they are attachment, which means the desire to be with somebody, a special person. Sex, which we've been talking about, that's self-explanatory. And the third component of romantic love is caregiving. And what that means is that uh, when you love somebody, you want to take care of them. You want what's best for them. You want their health and well-being to, to shine. You, you want them to be happy. Well, sociopaths can do attachment. You know, they definitely can latch on to somebody who they consider to be special. They certainly do sex. They do not do caregiving. Sociopaths just don't have the ability to put anybody else's interests before their own. They don't have the ability to really care about somebody else's well-being. So for that reason, they do not have the ability to truly love someone the way the rest of us do. Now, you, of course, didn't know any of this. And when they're saying all these things, you know, how much I love you and we'll be together forever and we'll be living in the lap of luxury, I heard that one, you believe it because this man or person, um, partner, seems to be showering you with attention and affection and telling you everything you want to hear and putting you up on a pedestal. And that is that makes you feel really good and it makes you bond and it starts to create this psychological bond. So it does hurt to know that it was all a lie and it does hurt to know that he's saying the same thing to the next girlfriend. Um, I would mention that the next girlfriend is sooner or later going to be in the same situation that you're in because he's going to dump her and, and tr betray her and whatever he did to you, he's going to do to the next one. So actually you might want to reframe how you feel about her into feeling sorry for her because she's going to experience everything that you've experienced sooner or later. I mean, it, it's just the way it is. These people do not have the ability to love authentically. And that's one of the reasons why it's so easy for them to like dump one person and move on to the next, because there was never any true connection to the first person to begin with. You know, it, it's all just a charade. It's, it's all just an act. Um, it's a very painful lesson, but the good news is that you have the ability to love, unlike this person, your former partner, who is never going to be able to do that. And even though it hurts, I think we would all rather be us than them. Okay, um, Josie asked, do you think sociopaths feel any type of bonding through sex? Um, sociopaths don't really bond, so I don't think that it's happening through sex either. And essentially, they view sex as... Um, physical gratification. They like the stimulation. Uh, they know that if you can have sex with somebody, it makes them easier to control. Um, they use sex as one of their tools in the toolbox, literally. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things to understand about sociopaths is that the sex drive is not out of control. Uh, even though they can have a lot of testosterone, um, which makes people want to mate. Um, their prime motivation is power and control. And so they are quite capable of withholding sex um, if it is allows them to exert power and control over somebody. So, you know, do they bond? I doubt it. I, I really doubt it. Oh, dear. So ZZ says, how do I deal with my wife using the legal system against me just so I won't interfere with the love bombing of her new target, who is our doctor? Um, 
I would suggest educating yourself as much as you can about um, the, situ uh, the, the personality types and also about what you need to know when you're involved in a divorce with them. Um, we've got lots of webinars on love fraud that specifically are about leaving a sociopath and divorcing a sociopath. Um, the key is to understand that you cannot deal with this person the way you th think you would want to deal with somebody that you once loved. Uh, you can't deal with this person as um, an equal negotiating partner. Uh, you can't do mediation because they don't necessarily want to mediate. I mean, mediation is for people who want to arrive at a solution and sociopaths don't necessarily want to do that. I mean, often what happens is that um, once they realize that it's over, I mean, you, you start to be, see behavior you never ever had any idea could possibly exist. I mean, all pretense is gone, all, um, all the breaks or any, you know, um, their, their motivation is changes, you know, the cat's out of the bag. There's no point with the charade anymore. I mean, you're going to see all the uglies. So the key is to understand what you are dealing with and do what you have to do to protect yourself. In all honesty, you can't be nice. Um, the only thing they understand is hardball. Um, your lawyer needs to understand that um, these people cannot be trusted. Uh, you know, they're, they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. Even when there's court orders, they're not going to do it. And you want to look for any leverage that you may have because the only thing they'll respond to is force and power. I mean, not necessarily physical force, but I mean, any leverage that you have, you need to be prepared to use if necessary. So, yeah, it's a mess. It, it, it's, it's a mess. Okay. Okay, so um, Keith and Marita asked, do they know what they are, that they are different? My ex was so against having kids. Does he know he's a sociopath and it's hereditary, or is the caregiving they know they can't do? Um... Some of them have, have been diagnosed and are aware that they've been diagnosed. I mean, there are some sociopaths who um, recognize that they have a disorder. Typically, however, the reaction is that they're fine with it. I mean, it, there's any, anybody who has been diagnosed as a sociopath and is upset about it, probably isn't really a sociopath or, or doesn't have a, a very high level of disorder um, because they just don't care. I mean, I've, I've heard from many people who self-identified as sociopaths and were proud of themselves. I mean, they consider themselves to be superior. Um, I have a couple videos on this if, if you want to take a look at that, but um, very few sociopaths experience any kind of distress. Uh, because of their disorder. Now, as far as your ex not wanting to have kids, all I could say is count your luck, your blessings. If you didn't have children, I mean, you weren't clear on that. But um, it's um, the last thing you want is children with a sociopath, uh, because it is hereditary, and then then you're stuck with them forever, and you're stuck with the partner forever. I mean, in in one way or another, or they abandon you, but plenty of them hang around to cause havoc forever. So um, I doubt that there was any real thinking with your ex about, you know, not wanting to pass on the disorder. It, it was probably more like he couldn't be bothered. Uh, that, that would be my guess as far as what the attitude was. <clears throat> okay, so the more I understand, Mystique says, the more I understand, the more scared I get. Um, you don't have to be scared. Once you understand that sociopaths are out there and how, if you know what the warning signs are, 
and you learn to trust your instincts, you'll be able to avoid them or get them out of your life fairly quickly. So education is the key. Education and will give you the understanding of what you're dealing with when you start to see the signs. And then the other thing is to pay attention to your intuition because your intuition is there to warn you. Um, it's baked into our DNA to protect us from predators and sociopaths are certainly predators. So um, you can protect yourself and you know educate yourself learn to trust your gut instincts and and you'll be fine i mean you may you may you, you probably will run across some at some point because there's just so many of them in the world but if your instincts are functioning you'll be able to get out of a situation be, before it gets out of hand okay so that appears to be what we have as far as questions for tonight. I thank everybody for joining us, and I'll talk to you again. All right. Bye-bye now, everybody.